go. So. so the overall kind of theme of the day is trends in future computing. And it made a lot of sense to me to also include, you know, retro computing in that, you know, how, how the platform started and how they developed and what can be learned from, from those platforms. Uh, so I think we've got critical mass. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Nathan Altus, who's the author of I Am Error, which is a detailed history of the Nintendo inter entertainment system. He's also a professor, lecturer. Uh, so, so Nathan, uh, can you introduce yourself and, and give an overview of your work and how you got into this and, and, and what drives you to uh, do the work that you're doing? Sure, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, for the past, I'm in my fourth year now as a teaching professor at in the computational media department at UC Santa Cruz in California. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was at Virginia Commonwealth University, so moved all the way across the country for this particular job. Um, I teach game design and development mm -hmm. here, along with some theory of computing and history of computing. And so I've uh, been really interested in the history of computing for the past few years. Obviously, wrote a book all about one specific platform, um, have an interest in other older, obsolete, lesser known platforms like the Bally Astrocade as well, and even some older software that runs on those platforms. So like the Family Basic, which was released in the 1980s for the Nintendo Family Computer. And so I like to program on those older machines as well. Uh, and then my current project is I am writing a history of Japanese board games in the 20th century. So not really related to computers at all, but they let me do it anyway. That's a really fascinating combination of activities. So um, do you study, would you say you study platforms in general, like all these computing platforms, or is there any specific trends that you look into or past historical trends? Um, definitely not all platforms. I'm not sure if that would be possible, but um, a lot of it centers in early platforms in computing. And the reason that I'm sure you're, anything that you study is somehow innately linked to your own mm -hmm. uh, personal biography and you tend to gravitate towards things that you had experience with, mm -hmm. especially when you were growing up. But that era of computing is really interesting to me because a lot of the rules uh, were not solidified and conventions were not solidified. Mm -hmm. So. I, I like looking at the early history of teaching those platforms as well, like user manuals that came with computing platforms in the 1970s and 80s, because mm. they had to teach the consumer not only like what a computer was, but how to use it and what it was supposed to do and how it fits into their daily life. And so a lot of the, the convention and rules, like what does a video game controller look like? Well, now they basically all look the same and there's some slight variations, but you know, there's going to be a D-pad and a few buttons. But in the 1970s and 80s, nobody knew what those things were supposed to look like. So there was a lot more, uh, I think, branches of exploration of trying to figure out what platforms could do and how they would do those and then how they would mm -hmm. teach the people that were going to use them. Because when the first video game platform came out, the Magnavox Odyssey, Nobody even knew where to put it in their living room or how to sit <laughs> around the console. And those things seem really silly to us today because, of course, you would know that. But back then, you had never had this alien object in your home. So you had right. to be taught how to interact even with the thing. Where does it, where does it sit? Do you sit close to it? Do you sit close to the television? And how do you arrange your family and who is included in who gets to play. And all of those were unanswered questions at the time. And so I'm interested in like taking our historical viewpoint and going backwards and thinking about what it was like to think about those things at the time when conventions weren't solidified. That's fascinating. Uh, one of the things, so we've uh, talked to this guy, Eben Upton, quite a bit. He's the creator of the Raspberry Pi, and it's a super popular platform. And the reason he created it is he was a lecturer at Cambridge, and he saw that the number of computer science students fell off a cliff for no reason. Mm 
and he couldn't figure out how come no new students are coming into the computer science department. And and what he what he figured out is that uh, there was a there was a generation that didn't get to play around with computers. They got a packaged computer where all the decisions were made for them. So they're getting mobile phones and things like that. So they never had the Commodore Apple IIe kind of experience to like mm. get in there and dink around. So they never formed the interest in the first place. So he created the Raspberry Pi to try and like make it accessible again. Uh, so when you, when you talk about you know that initial experience that people have with that first game console. Uh, I, I know for me, the NES and the Genesis, it was very formative, important life experience. Um, so um, when, when you, in studying and researching the, the NES platform, uh, did you find out anything really interesting or did anything, like how did you get into that in the first place? Um, around uh, like the early two. Th Okay, I'm trying to figure out how far I should go back. So I grew up with the NES, so there's that part of it. So it was something that I played with, but without understanding anything technically about it. It wasn't the first console I had because I was we had a 2600 kicking around, but it was the one. It was the first console that I wanted, like I asked for because of Super Mario Brothers. So there was that interest in it as you know, having grown up with that console, but around. Uh, in the mid and late 90s, when I was in college, uh, that's when emulation came to the fore. And it was the first time that it exposed some of the workings of that particular platform because uh, there was this emulator called Nesticle. And um, it allowed you to look at the sprite sheets for the games and change the palettes and do some light ROM hacking, which is editing the way that the game is operating in real time. So you could look at the pattern tables of the NES, make an edit to a pixel, and it would actually show up in the game. And I was fascinated by this because it was a different way to experience the games that I had played as a kid. Then going into the early 2000s is when people started to actually mess around with hardware hacking on the NES and reverse engineering the way that it worked and trying to experiment with Maybe we could write programs for it. So a lot of work done by the early homebrew community around the NES started to unlock uh, programming for that platform. And I kind of kept up with that until about 2007 or 2008, where I think things started to accelerate for me because I was then going into grad school and thinking more critically about um, those computing platforms. And that's where I started to actually experiment with some programming projects, and then got the idea that once Racing the Beam came out, um, I was like, wow, people can actually write an entire book about this kind of thing. And I loved that book. And I, the entire time I was reading, I was like, oh my God, I would love to read this book, but for the NES. And my um, advisor at the time said, well, why don't you write it? And I was like, well, I'm just a grad student. Like, why? How would I write a book? How's that possible? And then a call for the for authors for the book went out for a number of platforms and platform studies. And my advisors were like, no, really, you should do this. You should like throw your hat into the ring and see if you could write the book. And I was like, okay. And so it was just kind of luck and happenstance that led to to writing the book. But it just had always been something as a, a hobbyist interest of mine, but never really thought anything would come out of it other than tinkering around with the way that the NES worked. So when I was reading uh, I Am Error, uh, I, I kept trying to look for the chapter about like, because I have a very simplistic understanding. I just, well, how do they program the games? And I couldn't find it. It was, it, it seems like it's a relatively simple system and there's a few mm -hmm. components, but the, the, the methods they used changed dramatically. Yeah. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, well, s relatively simple system is a relative term. In the mm -hmm. 1980s, when it came out, it was quite sophisticated what it could do. Mm -hmm. um, it was based on a chipset that was old at the time, which was the, the 6502 processor. So that was um, a relatively inexpensive chip for the time, along with the Z80. Those were kind of the two dominant uh, chipsets at the time for arcade and home platforms. Uh, 
But when the NES came out, what it could do was non-trivial. I mean, just the ability to have hardware level scrolling was pretty complex at the time. And um, other computing platforms didn't have scrolling that was just built in. So getting a screen that would move mm -hmm. in real time was uh, relatively complex. And then the way that it, it handled tile-based systems was pretty innovative at the time. And it was borrowing these concepts. I mean, the, the NES was most similar to the ColecoVision. Like they really, Nintendo looked at that platform and said, oh, it plays Donkey Kong really well. Mm -hmm. We should model our platform after that. But um, the ColecoVision was a Z80 platform. Mm -hmm. So the question of like, how was the thing actually programmed? Um, I thought I answered that, but it, I mean, it was programmed in assembly um, as most platforms mm -hmm. were at the time, which means that you use the programming language of the specific chip that, un that was underlying the platform. So because its architecture was based around the 6502, they were using 6502 assembly. Now, what's different from programming in that way versus today is that today we have high level languages that we can use that cover a, a, a large variety of platforms. So when I teach game development to students today, I use JavaScript, which is the language of the web. And you don't have to program specifically for the Chrome browser or Safari or uh, Opera. You can just use JavaScript, and a lot of the low-level implementation details are done behind the scenes. So the programmer mm -hmm. doesn't have to worry about it. And that's very similar to, say, if you're programming in C or C++. But programming in 6502, means that you were programming something that was targeted to the architecture of that specific platform. Mm -hmm. And so there's the 6502 language set, the instruction set that's specific to that architecture, but also uh, the developers at Nintendo created the, um, the video hardware that would interface via the 6502. So there would be a bunch of commands that you were writing that were specific to getting the picture on the screen based upon the constraints of that particular platform. So the answer is a little more complicated than it is today, <laughs> where I would say, oh, uh, if you're making a Unity game, you're going to be using uh, this language, and it targets a bunch of different platforms. For the, Super Fam or for the Famicom, it was you're using the 6502 instruction set catered to the picture processing unit in that particular platform. So porting a game from the NES to another platform was much more complex because you would be targeting every specific architecture. Yeah, one, one question for you on the, so what I'm seeing is a resurgence of, of hardware like Commodore 64, Spectrum, whole load of new, uh, hardware that actually is retro hardware, right? And and they include FPGAs. They include you know they include sort of, sort of technology that isn't just sort of state of the art and speed, but obviously adaptability. And and I wonder what what your thoughts are of those systems because I think they're relatively popular if they're producing them now. So I don't know whether they're oldies who are buying these or whether they're new new people and new generations wanting to explore. So I, I don't know where, you know, where that is. That's sort of coming from. I think it's a mix of both. But I think we're also, what, what I see happening as a trend right now is um, people are not treating these consoles like they're antiquated. Mm. Rather, they're, they're treating them like, like they're a set of creative constraints. Mm. And I think that's mm. really important for creative people working today mm. where you have almost infinite variety of options to pursue. So, um, you know, I'm a musician. And when you open a digital audio workstation like Ableton Live, it's almost terrifying mm. because there's thousands of plugins that you can use. And... Mm infinite options that you can use to create something. So you almost get paralyzed by the infinite options that you have. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way with game de development today where the tools are so sophisticated that you can get a 3D game up and running with fairly minimal setup in a tool like mm -hmm. Unity or Unreal. Mm 
I think that we're seeing a return to these older consoles because it gives you a very narrow range of creative constraints mm -hmm. within which you can work, which mm -hmm. can be really liberating as a creator. So it says, uh, no, it's not all the colors to work with. You have 52 colors to work with. <laughs> And you have uh, 32 kilobytes of memory yeah. to work with. And you have this bit of RAM. And so people are making more accessible tools to interface with those older platforms, which I think is really important. So mm -hmm. rather than having to learn 6502 assembly, which can be daunting for people, there's now tools like Nestmaker, which allows non-programmers to make actual NES games with mm -hmm. a drag and drop interface. Mm -hmm. And that's really exciting to me, both as someone who's interested in those platforms, but also as a teacher, because it eliminates a lot of the barrier to entry with programming for an older console. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're seeing the rise of those tools. We're seeing the rise of hardware that enables us to play those games a little bit more easily, because emulators are still somewhat niche and arcane to most mm -hmm. people, you know, mm -hmm. your average consumer. Mm -hmm. So having something that's already pre-made and set up that, that can play those games or an FPGA that will give you almost 100% accurate emulation, 100% no, never exactly accurate, but you know what I mean. And then also a, a rise of fantasy consoles, which is essentially a virtual machine that mimics some of those constraints. And I'm talking about something mm -hmm. like Pico 8, where it it's like something that came out in the 80s, but it's actually a modern programming mm -hmm. environment. But it brings along those constraints to allow creators to work within those specific parameters. Yeah, I mean, the one of the interesting things, um, I, I, I worked with a, a games group in one of the hardware companies I was in, and you know their biggest challenge was people copying the game. I mean that was their that was their biggest problem because it was a it was a money industry, right? And so so uh, so they they couldn't do too much about it, but they would add some odd features in the game if it was copied. And one of the oddest features was uh, uh, you couldn't switch off the music. So it would incessantly play green sleeves right the way through your, your game to, to, to say that it's a copied version. I mean, and these are problems we don't think of today because they, they you know, they, they build in all these sophisticated, you know, verification systems and 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 locks and things like that. So you have to be pretty sophisticated to actually copy the game. But in those days, actually copying was a big problem. Uh, and then what do you do about it if you have identified someone who's actually done it? Yeah. That's, uh, that, that was, uh, I think that was a very different era, I think, on that side. Um, <clears throat> so the the Raspberry Pi Zero came out. It was a $5 tiny Raspberry Pi. And it's it's sold out every single time. And the reason is because people are primarily building little handheld game consoles with it. And they're probably playing these same games, those like NES, Game Boy games on those things. Uh, so you mentioned the the picture processing unit. Can you talk about what that was and and how that was a significant advancement, or, or you know what the characteristics of the PPU mm. were? Sure. And you find this kind of custom hardware in most platforms of the era and today as well. So you'll have. Uh, a central CPU, and that is just like the brain of the computer. So it allows you to do, um, at the time in assembly, very basic instructions, like essentially moving things in and out of memory and um, doing some basic math and a few other extra operations. So you take that as the heart of the platform to do the calculations. But then the engineers had to devise how to actually get a picture on the screen. So you have a CPU, but you need that CPU to drive some kind of interface with the television and also to drive some kind of interface with whatever the input mechanism is going to be. So in the case of the family computer NES, you would have two controllers. Um, so the picture processing unit is kind of this intermediary between the CPU and the television. And they had to decide what are the capabilities going to be for the Famicom. And so they made some decisions like, 
it's going to be tile based graphics. So that means that uh, the only thing that you can put on the screen are either eight by eight or eight by 16 pixel matrices of things that are either on or off. And then it stores a little bit of in more information for color as well. And so uh, using instructions that interface with the CPU, it then hands something off to the picture processing unit that says, I want to put a, a graphic tile here on the screen. And then they decided to divide the, the graphics into two different kinds. So there's a background objects, um, and then there's uh, sprite objects. And there's an equal number of both of those. And background objects have some, they're a little bit more constrained than sprites. So they can only be arranged according to a particular grid um, that's in the background. They can't move anywhere. They're very rigid, but they can be scrolled back and forth and you can update them as well. Now sprites, they can move anywhere on the screen and uh, you can individually address each one. But the drawback for those is that there can only be 64 on a screen at once in the case of the NES. And there can only be eight in a row on a particular scan line. After eight, the picture processing unit just doesn't render them anymore. So this was something that, that drove creativity with developers that what if you need to have mm. eight sprites in a line, what do you do? Well, the answer is like each frame, you programmatically bring more sprites on and off. And this is what creates something like Flickr. So the, the Flickr that is characteristic of the NES is really just the programmer trying to get more things on the screen than it was originally designed for. And then in some cases, they came up with really clever ideas using this constraint. So a good example is in The Legend of Zelda, when you're in the dungeons and you go into a, a doorway, it looks like Link actually passes like underneath the door frame. And the way that the developers did this was they stacked a bunch of invisible sprites in the door frames. So when Link would pass through, uh, there were too many sprites there, and so he would disappear. So they were using something that was a hard limitation of the hardware to, for creative purposes. And there's tons of examples of things like that where yeah. the developers were really being creative with the constraints that they have. So that's why platforms are interesting to me. It's like you have this rigid set of rules and we as human beings hate rules. So we <laughs> think of ways to break those rules <laughs> and those rules often spawn really interesting, clever workarounds yeah. to make the machine do things that they weren't supposed to. And I think the reason that that's relevant today is even though these platforms are 30, 40 years old, we haven't exhausted their possibilities. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. are making things on the NES today that were impossible at the time because we now have more information about the hardware than even Nintendo's engineers did. That's we're crazy. drawing out new ways to do things with these platforms. And to me, that's why they don't feel obsolete. Like, they're so sophisticated in their simplicity that people keep driving to pull creativity out of these platforms, even when they seem really elementary, simple, or retro. Yeah. So this is what, what we have today. This is what I was getting at. Like when you when you ask how did they do it, there's almost no answer. There's no there's no book you could have read or bought. Like they just they were creating with with these constraints. Um, I've seen a video, these people built something like Grand Theft Auto on the NES, or they, so they're doing really crazy things with it now. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, one of the interesting uh, pieces uh, that I got involved in, as I said, I was with a games group, and the company I was in, um, you know, you, you talk about innovative stuff. The company I was in decided to take the games programmers and told them to build an operating system. And so they built an operating system that is so fast. I mean, they wrote it entirely in, in assembler. It's, uh, it's probably one of the biggest pieces of assembler. It's like half a, half a megabyte of pure assembler. And the, the computer at the time boots in under one second from cold. Mm 
I mean, you just switch it on and you're in an uh, you're in a Windows operating system with windowing and things like that. But it was super dangerous. I mean, <laughs> you you could just you could just do an address to zero and the whole thing would blow up. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it had really interesting implications and it was all done by the games programmers pushing the hardware to extremes. So on one side, you know, super, super powerful and, and pushing, as you said, the hardware, doing things that no hardware group ever imagined you could ever do on these things. And the software people working out some really strange ways to solve problems. Um, but, uh, you know, they were probably the most innovative people at the time from a software point of view, because they pushed the technology way, way before uh, ahead of everything. Right and uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think I think you're exactly right. I think they, and uh, probably still lots to be explored on these things. Yeah, the, just last just this week, I saw a French developer is working on a Wi-Fi mapper for the NES. So mm -hmm. building Wi-Fi into a cartridge, and he already has a proof of concept of an online fighting game. So he was playing on real hardware with a cartridge that had Wi-Fi against another instance of the game through an emulator. So that's something that for a long time wasn't thought to be possible. And I have another uh, a friend who she's a NES developer, Rachel Simone Weil, who uh, created a Twitter software for the NES. So you can tweet from a cartridge as well. I mean, this stuff is just... Mm. It's it's remarkable that this can be done at all, but there's people that mm. are so interested in it because of those constraints, like what can we continue to do? And you would mm. never would have anticipated that 20 years mm. ago, 10 years right. ago. Mm. One of the really interesting peripherals was the, the duck hunt gun, right? Like, how did they make that work? <laughs> um, complicated question, but it did rely... so. What that gun was looking for was really um, just a light source. And so the way that things like um, Duck Hunt and other uh, the gun games is if you watch really carefully, when you shoot the gun in Duck Hunt, the screen goes black and then there's a white square that appears. It's just for a few frames. And all the gun was looking at is if it's pointed at that white Square, so like an illuminated spot mm -hmm. on the screen. So you can do the same thing if you are pointing the gun at a light bulb at the same time. It's like if that frame is on and it's looking at a light, then it registers a hit. Um, I write about this a bit and I am error about the way that it works because it doesn't work on modern televisions because the refresh rate is not the same as on CRTs. So that's been a big problem is, oh, yeah. is the games don't work on HD TVs because the refresh system is not the right. same, the way that the, yeah. the screen is drawn. But again, people are working on workarounds for that as well. Yeah, and they did some clever timings, if I remember, of the CRT and waiting for it to do all the lines and then use that as a critical time to do processing in the background. Uh, you know, the, I, I remember them talking about this and the details of their knowledge of actually doing that in between the scan, the scan, the scans, and then playing with scan lines uh, for stuff, mm -hmm. uh, amazing. Um, yeah, the, I, I don't think modern. I mean, on the whole, modern um, games programmers probably don't have to deal with that so much. I mean, that understanding of how that part of it. Yeah, yeah, not that, not that tightly wound to the um, to the television display. Yes. Yes. But they have other things to worry about, you know, <laughs> screen buffers and <laughs> pushing as many polygons as they can. They have different constraints to work with. Different them. constraints. I, I attended some GPU and robotics talks earlier today, and the duck hunt's the most interesting thing I've heard today. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, so isn't there one where they reverse the game and the duck is un actually hunting you? Uh, isn't there the... The reverse game, uh, or is that the one where uh, it was a deer hunter where they gave deers guns, and so <laughs> you actually your job was to avoid all the deers. Uh, there's, uh, there's one where they reversed the whole concept of the game. I've forgotten which one it was. Um, yeah. So uh, 
another interesting topic is, you know, we're in the modern era of microprocessor development. Uh, and then there's a lot of efforts around, you know, how do you innovate around microprocessors? But uh, one of the things the Nintendo people had to deal with is they were trying to make a custom Motorola 6502 processor and navigating the minefield of patents and property IP. Uh, I, I, do you remember uh, the, the section of the book around, you know, what, how, the, how the Japanese got around those, those patents that Motorola had and, and what, what they did? Uh, yeah, the answer is uh, basically they just stole it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, things were different back then in the 1980s because, uh, you know, transcontinental communication took a lot longer. It was much harder in a non-globally co uh, connected economy uh, to find out if somebody had, you know, infringed on a patent. And so... Nintendo, first of all, they, it would have made the most sense for them to pick the Z80 because the Z80 was more dominant as a processor in um, Japanese arcade games. Uh, Namco used it, for instance, like in Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. The people that were studying computer architecture at the time in Japan were much more familiar with the Z80. So college students graduating and joining uh, development teams, they would know that architecture. So the president of Nintendo, who was, you know, quite a cunning and ruthless businessman, said, OK, if we choose the 6502, that'll give us a competitive advantage because nobody will know how to program it in Japan. So they can't create a competitor. Well, that created a problem for Nintendo's engineers because they also didn't know how to program it. So they had to hire like a couple young hotshots that had been toying around with the 6502 to, for instance, you know, like port some of their arcade games from Z80 to 6502. But the way that they tried to get around the patent was they cut a line, like physically cut a line in the 6502. Uh, that was the, uh, I forget what function they cut out, but it's, it's some kind of, um, it's n like digital subtraction or addition, I forget. Like exactly. What or they they remove some part. Yeah, they just they basically eliminated one instruction that's kind of inessential. Oh, it's decimal mode. That's that's what okay. was taken out. So decimal mode math, cut the line. They added the uh, audio processing units to it, so it became kind of a custom chip. And then they called it a day. Yeah. Well, when when Commodore caught wind of that, they tried to sue Nintendo but it ultimately didn't go anywhere. They said, oh, look, they completely copied it. But what I talk about in the book is it's not exactly true. I mean, it was more, like I said, like it was modeled after the ColecoVision and even used some of the terms that the ColecoVision's video processor used. So it's more accurately that they were um, copying that. And to really unpack why that happened, you would have to talk about like the way corporate espionage works in the United States versus Japan. And a lot of people were stealing things mm -hmm. from one another at the time or making slight variations. It was just kind of the wild west of computing at the time. Um, I was just watching this video interview of Sophie Wilson, who was the designer of the ARM architecture. Mm -hmm. And it was her and this other guy, I can't remember the guy's name, but he made this point where he was able to create these microprocessors using like cardboard and wire wrapping. And he, he, he said, there's this one little point at the beginning of the 1980s where you could hand build a computer like this. And then after that, it just became so small and so micro that I, the, the, the exercise of physically crafting a computer no longer made any sense. But um, you just have to feel jealous for people that were alive at that time when, you know, you could make a computer out of cardboard or you could, you know, make a game or something like that. Well, well, I mean, computer science courses at that time, you, you know, if you did the embedded course, you would end up building a computer. I mean, basically, you got a breadboard, you got a 68,000 yeah. or something <laughs> and, some memory and, and a whole load of horrible wiring would occur, right? And, and you would actually build something. And, you know, I can't imagine they do that today. I think that a... No, they, they do. Maybe I can oh, give really? you some, some hope and reassurance that oh, okay. you know, within the engineering department here, they still have very low level assembly classes and mm. you um, build virtually 
a um, a small computer. Mm-hmm. Like you actually craft it. They can make them in hardware as well. And um, this is the one point where you know I I sometimes differ with folks is that like I am actually not jealous of you know going back in time to the 80s to develop that way because as a modern developer, it is absolutely mm. awful. <laughs> <laughs> the way the conditions under which they programmed at the time, because, you know, over the summer, I did a family basic game um, using the basic for the family computer. And I bought the Japanese hardware and I used it. And it's absolutely awful to develop that way. <laughs> if you bump the cartridge, you erase all of your work. Oh, There's man. no way to see all your code oh. on the screen at the time. Yeah. Now I can work in an emulator and program family basic and never have to deal with hardware. I can always have things mm-hmm. backed up. I can use modern tools to do that. And um, the development stack today versus then is light years beyond. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I'm not nostalgic for that sort of <laughs> difficult work. I teach a graduate seminar to students where I make them type in a program in basic because I, I teach them like, look how awful things were at the time you are so lucky (laughs) look how good you have it now but i think it is important to go through that process that's the part that i agree with is there is a certain relationship to the hardware that i do miss which is that you can understand the computer at a very low level Mm. like the playstation 4 is so infinitely complex Mm. that it i feel like i could never fully know how the entire thing works but with the NES, you can kind of get the entirety of an understanding of how the machine works, get a very intimate level. So that part of it, I think, is important. But I have zero nostalgia for having to, you know, <laughs> maniacally hand code this stuff on ancient machines. It's we. I'm glad we have the tools that we have today. Um, are there any programming languages uh, that people are using to? To program these things now like do you see people using rust or javascript to do uh, nes programming and then somehow convert it over you can program um, nes games in c that's been around for about 10 years i think someone worked on that um over the years i've seen a bunch of different projects that went to various levels of completion i know someone was working on like a python compiler um because of the limitations of the NES, you're never going to get quite the performance unless you go to assembly language, just because it's as close to the metal as you can get without writing actual machine language, which nobody would do. Um, but C will compile to assembly. It's always going to be a little bit slower and slightly more bulky. But even a tool like the thing that I was talking about before, this this uh, Nest Maker. Um, it allows drag and drop creation of NES games, and you can do everything through a graphical user interface. But under the hood, it still has assembly modules. Mm-hmm. So there are ways to program for the NES that are higher level, but ultimately it's always going to go back to assembly. And there's the trade off of performance and understanding of exactly how the thing is working versus uh, ease of use. Mm-hmm. So there is an interesting relationship between the game consoles and the the physical arcades you would go to and put the coins in and so on. So Nintendo would release things like uh, Punch-Out in the arcade, and then they would port it to the NES. So um, what were the differences in that? Do you know what the difference might have been in those arcade cabinets versus the the home consoles? Was it the same stuff or or different hardware altogether? Um, The answer is both, and it depends on the era that you're looking at. So Nintendo has this really long history of iterating over an an idea again and again, like they'll constantly return to the same thing. So take an example like Duck Hunt again. So Duck Hunt um, had an arcade game, but it originally goes back to toys made by Nintendo in the 1970s where they would have a machine that would project like a shadow of a duck on your wall. And you would have a little gun and you would shoot at the duck on the wall. And this was called duck hunt. So it's a purely mechanical process. 
this game. And then they thought, well, that's a pretty good idea. What if we made this into a digital game instead? And there's a bunch of instances of Nintendo doing this, like um, like with Wild Gunman, which is like another uh, light gun game for the NES. They had a film version that you could play, meaning you go to the arcade and you have a gun that you shoot at a movie screen. And so based upon where you shot, it would change to another part of the projector and show you a different film strip. So it's kind of like an early Laserdisc style game. So Nintendo did this kind of thing a lot. Now, when they launched the family computer, the first games that came out were ports of their successful games. So Donkey Kong, Mario Brothers, uh, Donkey Kong Jr., things like that. All of those arcade games were Z80 games. So they had to completely port from the original versions. And the way that was done really varied according to the game. Sometimes it would mean they had access to the source code. And so they could do a fairly smooth transition from the original to the ported version. Sometimes they didn't have access to the source code. So they would send somebody to the arcade and have them watch the game and take notes and then reproduce it from those notes. This happened a lot in the early era of video games where, um, like, say, Commodore programmers in England, they would say, hey, we need a port of this popular arcade game. So they would send this, like, teenage programmer to the arcade, go look at it, and then make your version for the Commodore. They would take notes. Sometimes they would pay a kid to play the game and watch the game. So... That was, you know, initially when they were making Famicom games. Well, they, Nintendo eventually made a slightly modified version of the Famicom for the arcade. So it was almost identical hardware, except with a few extras and some slight differences in the way that the um, picture processing unit would work. And then they would simultaneously release games for both arcade and the NES. So there is an arcade version of, for instance, Super Mario Brothers that is slightly different than the original. Like the, it's it's harder. As you can imagine for the arcade, you want more quarters to be coming in and the level arrangement was different. Or games like Balloon Fight where it was made for dual screens in the arcade. So a lot of these early NES games would be called like versus Excite Bite or versus Tennis or versus Balloon Fight. So it really varied according to the era that you're looking at. Um, you mentioned the hardness. I remember the NES games were often extremely difficult. Is that a legacy of the need to try and get people to consume quarters? It's partly that, but it's also the, the, the development constraints at the time. Because once the family computer took off in Japan around 1985, it became the platform for games. So what that does is it attracts a lot of developer um, interest. So a lot of people want to make a game for this platform because they can make a lot of money. Yeah. And at the time, game development was a lot different. You didn't have a lot of play testers, focus groups, years of development. You might have a game that was literally created in six weeks and was not play tested by anybody except for the developer that made it, or it could be like a handful of people. So the games were bad, like they were programmed <laughs> poorly, they weren't tested, so they may not be completely finished or they might be impossible for the average player to beat them. So there is the legacy of the arcade, but also a lot of it is just like, it was poorly implemented, it wasn't tested very well. They had very rushed development cycles. I mean, even a game like Super Mario Brothers or Legend of Zelda, they were made in six months by six people. Oh. Compare that to something like, you know, the latest Assassin's Creed, where hundreds of people make it over a period of multiple years. It's play tested over and over again. They make sure that people can play through the entire game. It's just a completely different industry at the time. It seems like, you know, you play a game like Ninja Gaiden 3 or uh, Ghosts and Goblins, and they're just unbearably unfairly hard. And, and maybe it is, a you know, because it was the programmer doing the playtesting, maybe, and they 
play tested it 10,000 times. So for them, it was easy, but for everybody else, it was just unreachable. Yeah. Um, so we've got uh, 13 minutes left. Does anybody on the call have any comments? It's been relatively quiet. Any questions, Joe? Fascinating stuff. Appreciate it. Uh, and I shot. I shot Jr. I have a. I have a question or a discussion suggestion. Um, Rex was talking about the development history and and how things evolved. And um, Nathan, can you talk about mappers perhaps and how that affected development as the hardware actually became more complicated over time? Sure. Um, so the the family computer was spec'd and and engineered to play uh, to recreate Nintendo's arcade titles. So Donkey Kong being the main specification. So you can almost think about the family computer was like the Donkey Kong machine. And when platforms come about, they're often spec'd for a specific game. So the Atari 2600 is spec'd to play Pong-like games and combat. And then anything that came after that was some sort of expansion or elaboration on those concepts or people working with those constraints. The family computer was the same way. So Donkey Kong um, needed to get X number of sprites on the screen, needed to have X number of levels, had to have these particular color constraints. And so you see that in the early hardware for um, the family computer is, OK, you can scroll but there's only enough memory in the family computer to hold two screens at once. So a lot of the early family computer games, they might scroll, but they only scroll like between two screens. So Gyromite, Ice Climber, games like that. Just a little bit of scrolling because Nintendo didn't really anticipate what you would need beyond that. Well, um, Super Mario Brothers kind of set the mold for what the family computer could do because it maxed out every single capability of the machine, uh, the stock hardware of how it was designed. So they figured out a way to scroll worlds. Uh, they figured out a way to heavily compress levels so they could have lots and lots of different stages and varied worlds and lots of enemies. But um, uh, Shigeru Miyamoto, who was the director of Super Mario Brothers, has often bragged about how they used every single byte except for two in Super Mario Brothers. So it's just like packed full of code. They could not put anything else in there. So that's 1985. And we know that many games were released 19, after 1985. Well, Nintendo thought that the answer was going to be, well, we're going to release a new add-on hardware. And so in Japan, they released a disk system. So games could be, re be released on uh, floppy disks. And Nintendo made a proprietary uh, floppy disk. And they thought that was going to be the future of the Nintendo, kind of like the Sega CD would augment the, the Mega Drive. Well, uh, the problem was when they created like a floppy disk format was piracy. And people just were, could easily copy the games, and they figured out ways to copy the software. And so. Nintendo never released that in the United States because they were afraid of the same thing happening. Well, concurrently with the disk system, there were engineers and Nintendo working on uh, hardware mappers. And what that is, is it's an extra bit of hardware that's added into the cartridge that allows additional capabilities for the, for the games. And that manifests in a bunch of different ways. The first way was like just giving us more memory to work with so we could store more graphics. And you could do something in code, which is called bank switching, which is you could look at another piece of memory and grab the data from there and incorporate it into the game. And um, Ghosts and Goblins, or as it's known in, in Japan, Makayamura, is one of the first cartridges that had extra memory. So they could uh, create new graphics, have more enemies, more things on the screen, so on and so forth. As the family computer developed, those mappers became more and more sophisticated. So some would add uh, additional sound channels, but this was exclusive to Japan. So you could create more sophisticated uh, audio compositions. You could have even more memory. You could have a rewritable memory. So RAM instead of ROM, which means that you could write graphics data on the fly. So you could create like animated tiles. You also got really 
um, sophisticated programmer tools like scanline counting, which would allow you to do uh, graphical changes while the screen was being drawn. And all of these things went beyond what the family computer could originally do. And so programmers had access to more and more things that they could use to circumvent the original constraints of the machine. And that still happens today. People that are working on new Nintendo games often write new mapper hardware that emulator authors will then support. So this, the Wi-Fi game that I was talking about before, that they have to write a new mapper so those games can be emulated properly. Thank you. Uh, Brian, did you have a question? Yeah, it's a two-part question. Um, do you know what Dwarf Fortress is and what are your thoughts on it and future game games or gaming capabilities with it? I am aware of Dwarf Fortress. Um, I don't know if I have any thoughts on it other than it's, you know, in a long tradition of ASCII-based roguelike style games, although it has become its own sprawling generative world and the developer's been working on it for over a decade. Um, can you be more specific about, you know, how it relates to the future? Do you mean specifically the future of Dwarf Fortress or how it relates to platforms? Well, like right now, I believe it only runs on a single thread um, because the developer hasn't open sourced it or anything. Um, but everything that he's put into it, all the, you know, the logic or the algorithms and just everything involved in the development of the AI and stuff for each dwarf, for example, um, is incredible. So if that were to go into the real world of gaming, do you think that there would be limitations with hardware um, that we have now, or do you think that it would be capable of handling something like that? Does that make any sense? Um, not totally, because, I mean, the game runs on hardware. So do you mean, like, if Dwarf Fortress was ported? Yeah. Or if there was, like, um, like, to run on consoles? Is that what you mean? Yeah, sure. I mean, it would be like porting most any project. There's nothing unique to Dwarf Fortress that makes it more or less difficult as a port because uh, it still runs on some kind of architecture, and that architecture is PC. I don't know what the game is programmed in or specifics of implementation details, but there's lots, lots of examples of games like that being ported to consoles and with consoles increasingly being network connected, they have the ability to patch and update. So there's nothing specific to that game that I see as a, a roadblock to moving to a different platform other than just, at this point, it's the developer's fiat. They, they get to decide where that machine, where that, where that code is going to go. And they don't seem really interested in making it a console game. I mean, it, it's kind of a PC game through and through. Yeah. Hopefully that helped as an answer. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Richard? Oh, yeah. So I was, uh, some of the conversations about tiny ML and other kinds of like uh, capabilities, these, the, the small chips that people are playing with right now. Uh, it sounds like there is an opportunity to sort of like take the, the console as like the old. But bring it onto the the like an ARM chip with the the Cortex processor, where you could actually have some machine learning and some other additional engagement um, added to it. So I've been excited by all of those changes, and I love hearing all these retro things. Um, have your students or people that you're working with started moving to say some of these other microcontrollers as a way to like express another generation of game or capability? Um. Yeah, it's a complex question. So I have a couple students that they design specifically for older platforms. So um, for instance, one of my grad students right now, now Tamara Duplantis, um, she's a programmer and musician, and she creates Game Boy software that runs on 
actual Game Boy hardware, but she does things that are modern, like games that couldn't have been made at the time. So she makes like generative audio cartridges and collaborative music making tools for the Game Boy. And that to me is one of the most interesting areas of um, obsolete platforms because one of the problems I have with the term retro is that it gets too tied up in nostalgia and people idealize these platforms as if like those were the good old days and now we've been ruined because like we have to play (laughs) these awful new games. And that's not really interesting to me. And it's not interesting to like, you know, make games that are in the mold of old games. Like every year you see like, look, I made Pac-Man run on the umpteenth different platform. Like that's really boring to me. Like it's interesting as a programming project. But to me, I would rather see modern ideas put onto old machines and meaning like we've learned all of these things about game design about programming why not make modern games for retro (laughs) platforms so i do have students that work in that mold but they're much more interested in making new kinds of experiences and interfaces through those platforms but most of them are working with the native hardware but they are using augmented software to work with them. So mostly you would be developing in an emulator versus, you know, writing on the original machine. The eventual output will be a cartridge that will run on that original machine. But we use all the modern conveniences of software in order to develop on those platforms because otherwise, like, you'll just pull your hair out because we have so many better ways to develop, like, It's much better to work in an emulator most of the time and then test in hardware to make sure that it works. But these modern chipsets that can emulate very accurately are really useful because of that capability. Like they they augment the original platforms to allow us to work more quickly and more elegantly on those platforms. It it seems like the FPGA would provide a very interesting set of capabilities. I could imagine you put a cartridge in and then that directly influences the architecture of the chip itself uh, by you know, dynamically writing what that chip is. So uh, those kinds of possibilities could be quite extensive. Definitely, those have become really the, the holy grail of emulation right now because they're one of the most accurate models of the hardware that we can do because we're emulating hardware with hardware, yeah. which ironically is, emulation coming full circle because emulation used to mean hardware supplement back when it was defined in the 1960s and it only later became software um but that is kind of the holy grail of accuracy but there's always a trade-off so fpgas are great but it can't really replace say the um interface so there is something about the nintendo controller that is authentic to that specific game or the Atari 2600, I mean, has the joystick with the one button. That's a different feel than playing on a keyboard or just having a one size fits all controller. And in many cases, emulation can never be perfectly accurate because for many arcade games, they had custom hardware for the interface as well. Like there's a parachute game called Ripcord and it had an actual parachute that you pull. How do you do that with FPGA? The answer is you really don't. There's there's always a, a there's always a concession that you have to make with emulation and simulation. Well, thanks a lot. I mean, uh, so we're we're at the top of the hour. Uh, do you have anything you want to? You have any new books or I am error is the way to go if people want to learn more. Yeah, I am error. You're welcome to follow me on Twitter. Sure. Um, Circuit Lions. Or you can just Google my name and it'll come up. Uh, right now I'm I'm working on, like I said, uh, I'm translating uh, Japanese board games from, many of them are from the 1980s are, and are adaptations of video games. So I post a ton of stuff on Twitter about translations that I'm working on. Um, 
I'm writing a new book, but it will take years to finish because books take a long time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, sure thank you. Thank you, Nathan. That's You're very welcome. Thanks for inviting yeah. me. I'm sharing uh, links in the chat now. You know, I'll email them too. Well, thank you. No problem. All right.